All right, I see people joining in. So we have 13 people already. 15s going up, going up. So welcome, welcome everyone. Good morning to everyone. Uh, we are very, very happy to, to be here for this uh, webinar. It's going to be really, really interesting. Uh, today's topic is about smart and green local agri-food value chains. Uh, we are a partner event at EU Green Week, so that's great as well. Uh, just a little bit of technical details. We want to make this uh, webinar as interactive as possible, so do not hesitate to ask a question in uh, the chats. Uh, you can also raise your hand and we will give you the floor. Uh, so please ask questions. Uh, we like to make this as interactive as possible. My name is Arno Morrison. I'm one of the thematic experts uh, at the Policy Learning Platform, and we are moderating this uh, webinar with Mark. Mark, how are you this morning? Good morning from Nice uh, this morning, Arno, uh, and the rest of you. Um, I think, you know, we all agree that without food, life would be a lot less interesting. So I'm looking forward to this exchange with all of you this morning. Thank you, Mark. And we have uh, three great uh, speakers with us this morning. Uh, we have Elvia Domingo. How are you, Elvia? Good. Thank you. Very, very happy to share this morning with you today. Thank you. Ex excellent. And Elvia, she's a Regional Innovation Scheme Program Manager at uh, European Institute of Innovation Technology um, in Food. And here we are going to look at different initiatives to make food systems smarter and greener. We also have with us this morning, Rosinda Pimenta from Portugal. How are you, Rosinda? I'm fine, thank you. Hello, everyone. So uh, good to be here too. Great to have you here. And Rosinda, she will be from Mertola Food Network from Portugal. And finally, last but not least, we have Vasiliki Papadopoulou uh, from Greece. How are you this morning, Vasiliki? Good morning, everyone. I'm sorry for the difficult name. No, it's, it's great. No, <laughs> no worries. I didn't make any, any pronunciation mistake this time, so that's good. And um, she will be and in Greece. So great to have you here. But before we start with presentation and introduction, Elena, you have a presentation to share with us to tell us a little bit more about the Intra-Europe Policy Learning Platform. So I leave you um, the floor, Elena. You have five minutes. Yes, thank you, Arno, and good morning, everybody. I am Elena Ferrario. I am the thematic manager of the Inter-Europe Policy Learning Platform. And uh, today, before going into the real topic of this uh, webinar, I take five minutes. Thank you, Arno, <laughs> for uh, giving the, 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 the framework that allows us to be here today. We are organizing this webinar, of course, in the framework of the EU Green Week but it is a, a webinar organized by Interreg Europe and maybe some of you do not know the program yet. So I think it's a good opportunity to just to give you a few elements of the program in particular because uh, the new uh, generation of programs has just started and we have um, closed the first call for proposals just a few days ago. So there are some new elements in interregional cooperation that we are happy to share with you. So let's see if this thing works. Yes, so Interreg Europe is the only uh, cooperation program that allows all uh, countries in Europe to work together. So we are working with 29 countries uh, now and we have a program budget of 379 million euros. We work with one uh, main uh, priority which is called capacity building covering all topics of uh, the cohesion policy, which you see on the screen. Um, the objective of this program is to improve regional development policies, including, of course, investment for growth and jobs. And how do we do that? Through capacity building. We still believe that capacity building, so improving the skills of those who actually manage the uh, public policies, is the key element for uh, delivering better policies. So uh, this program is primarily dedicated to policymakers. And what we do, we allow exchanging experiences across Europe to improve uh, the specific uh, regions or territories, cities in each corner of Europe. Um, as I said, one cross-cutting topic, uh, working, however, on six of them at the end of the day, smart, green, connected, social, citizens, and governance. We still don't have a concentration principle of 80% of the program budget going to 
And uh, there are two actions financed by the program. One is the classic projects, traditional way of doing cooperation. And this is what I was mentioning a few moments ago. The first call is just closed, the first of May, and we have received 134 applications covering all the six thematic areas of the program. Uh, and uh, since uh, quite a few years now, we, are, uh, we have put in place a new tool, which is called the Policy Learning Platform. This is a tool that allows capitalizing on all the project results of Internet Europe uh, in order to offer the possibility to anybody in Europe uh, beyond uh, the partners financed in each project to access this information, this wealth of knowledge, these interesting results, the good practices. And we, uh, we do this through a number of activities. Um, we allow, therefore, this policy learning even indeed beyond the projects through accessing this knowledge, accessing people who work on the good practices, and of course, offering expert support services. This is the golden service of the platform that I will mention in a moment. Accessing knowledge means that we have a huge database of good practice that are validated by our uh, team of experts. So there, is a num there are criteria that allow judging on uh, the, um, let's say, innovative and uh, transferability uh, criteria on, uh, of the good practices. And we produce regularly articles, policy briefs, news um, to keep the inter community uh, updated on uh, policy development in uh, the European Union. Accessing people, meaning that we work with this community of more than 25,000 practitioners of regional development policies, and we put them together, uh, we make them work together in events mainly, uh, just like the one of today, so that they can interact and learn and exchange. And then uh, the last point is this, uh, what I mentioned earlier, is this um, set of service called uh, expert support. And these are the services that really go in depth into uh, trying to help one specific organization, one specific region in its own policy challenges. How do we do that? We organize peer reviews and we organize matchmaking sessions. In particular, the peer reviews are a moment where a two days uh, event, two days meeting where the beneficiary of the peer review can together with a group of clearly uh, like a very well-selected peers discuss its own policy challenge. And the peers, which are selected within the inter community, contribute with their expertise, with their experience, to give advice to this organization, to this region. Giving advice, meaning listing a number of, we call them policy recommendations, that go really uh, very concretely into uh, suggestions on how to improve uh, a specific policy. Uh, implementation of a policy. As you can see on this map, we have uh, organized already 38 peer reviews, a little bit around all countries in Europe. Um, we have also organized matchmaking sessions, which are basically with the similar concept, a mini peer review. So these are meetings of two hours where, where we put together um, somebody that has a challenge and people that have already solved a similar challenge somewhere else. So we create connections. And uh, this is a service that is completely for free. Um, I like always to uh, also show you this slide because these are the key elements that allow you to understand what are these, the, the benefits of a peer review, because this is an excellent opportunity for you, for anybody in Europe to access the knowledge of specific people that can really help you work better. Uh, it is a very easy accessible format. Uh, there is a very short application that doesn't really require much. The experts uh, help you uh, in, in the process. Um, there are focused exchanges. You can get uh, contact with selected peers. It's also an opportunity for you to involve local stakeholders in your territory to work together. This is extremely important for policy development. And everything is done by the team of experts. So it's a... Uh, it's, um, um, yeah, it's a service that we organize from A to Z, basically. So with these words, and I know that I don't have a lot of time, I give back the floor to Arno. Um, but I'm here to answer all questions that you may have on these services. And at the end of this webinar, we will also collect your uh, possible interest on maybe uh, some of you, you may want to know a little bit more about this service. And I think, again, being an excellent opportunity, you should not miss it. Thank you, Arno. I give the back, the floor back to you.
Thank you very much, uh, Elena, for your short introduction on policy learning platform. And I will go a short introduction on the topic of smart and green local agri-food value chains. Uh, before we start, Elena mentioned many of our services, very interesting services, from policy briefs uh, to matchmaking and peer reviews. Uh, some example related to the topic of today. Uh, we organized a thematic workshop on innovation for societal challenges. And there we had a very interesting good practice from uh, Ireland looking at bottom-up food network. Uh, and that was really inspiring. So you can visit the conclusion page and uh, here. Uh, we organized an online discussion on urban rural innovation linkages. And what we found out in this online discussion is that food uh, network uh, food systems can really bring together urban and the rural uh, linkages together. Uh, we also recommend you to, to subscribe to uh, our policy digest in research innovation to have the, our latest news on events that we are organizing. And finally, regarding matchmaking and peer reviews, uh, we have recently organized a matchmaking on supporting interregional value chain. Um, uh, and there was very interesting in Finland. So very similar topic as well. And please have a look at matchmaking and peer reviews. And again, we look at if you're interested at the end of this webinar. So why are, why are local agri-food value chains so important today? I mean, first uh, we are part of in this long-term uh, transitions and local food uh, value chains can really uh, bring more sustainable food value chains and bring like biodiversity protection, uh, environmental protections, uh, contribute to more sustainable food system, like uh, thinking about reducing transportation emissions and so on. And also food, local food value chains can bring urban and rural uh, regions together, reduce intermediaries, bring um, higher revenues for farmers, better traceability of food systems as well, and so on. And two disruptive and terrible events has happened recently uh, that are bringing a lot of disruption in the food uh, systems. The first one, of course, is the COVID-19 crisis that has really disrupted everything. And more recently, the Russian invasion of Ukraine that also disrupted the food value chain. So local agri-food uh, value chain can be really a solution to address long-term transitions and also the short-term and medium-term disruptions. Of course, uh, we also part of this um, great transition to um, EU Green Deal. And the, the one of the big strategy of the EU Green Deal is this uh, farm to fork uh, strategy uh, aiming to make food systems more healthy, sustainable, environmentally friendly, and so on. So farm to fork uh, aim to rethink completely the food systems from the production to the consumption. And of course, uh, local food uh, value chain can really be uh, part of this uh, strategy and really important to contribute to sustainable food system. Looking at Horizon Europe uh, in the work program on food, bioeconomy, natural resources, agriculture, and environment, you also have a very diff many different uh, research and innovation actions that aim to target uh, local food value chains. So that's a very interesting topic as well. And finally, Interag Europe can really inspire you uh, in delivering better policies. We have many, many good practices that you can look in the database. Um, and here are a few of them related to smart and green local food value chains. Uh, we have these good practices from uh, Milan, trying to bring together urban and rural uh, linkages through food systems. Also digitization, a big topic, and LVI is going to touch up on it uh, for, for making food system green and smart. Um, and also green good practices re regarding more local uh, networks and community bottom-up uh, food systems. So that's it uh, from our introduction. Let's move on to our uh, keynote speaker. Elvia, the, the floor is yours. And please, the audience, you can use uh, chat and use uh, raise your hand to ask questions at any time, of course, to make it as interactive as possible. Elvia, the floor is yours. You have uh, 12 minutes. Thank you very much, Arnold. Thank you for this fantastic introduction. Let me share my screen and see if 
Um, you can see it now in presentation mode. Is it okay now? Yes, it's perfect. Perfect, thank you. So yes, um, Arnaud, um, thank you for inviting me today and thank you all for joining uh, this, this session with us today. Uh, as Arnaud was uh, already mentioning, in fact, food and agricultural practices are one of the backbones of our society and better food systems are also key to transitioning towards a sustainable economy. Um, but also, we have to say, and, and I would like for you to reflect on this, on these three words that we are the key topics of today, smart, green, and local value chains. These are just three words, but they do represent, uh, they are of major importance because they represent how the European Union is waking up and recognizing the importance of reshaping our food system and recognizing the critical role that these systems have on achieving the Green, the green Deal um, goals, but also a sustainable, healthier, and more trusted food system. And let's see if uh, the early uh, morning coffee had any effect on you. How would you say the average of um, family farm income in the EU is lower than uh, non-farming family? across the EU? Well, 30%. <laughs> stop, stop guessing. Uh, you will get surprised as I was. It is 60% lower. This is representing, uh, according to the World Economic Forum latest uh, statistic, a huge disproportion in between the relevance that the agri-food ecosystem has for our health, our climate, our day-to-day -day living and economies, and uh, the way that we are valuing it and qualifying it. But of course, this challenge does not come on its own. Together with the farming economy that is limiting the, the farmer's ability to invest and adopt climate uh, more sustainable practices, it also stops the engagement of new generations in, uh, in the farmers, but across the food value chain as well. Next to that, the climate change conditions and the extreme weather conditions that we are facing are making uh, farming a very risky business and less and less farmers want to invest uh, their, um, their money and, and, and their budgets on, on farm. On top of that, the current practices that we are applying across the whole value chain, not only in farming, uh, we are seeing that uh, we are having a lot uh, crop, uh, crop loss, but also food waste, which is currently 30% of all the food that we produce. Together with this, we have uh, the lack of knowledge and valuable on the ground information accessible to the main um, producers. Technology and uh, use of data are also uh, missing in this very, very traditional sector that is very slowing in adopting new technologies. And we cannot forget that uh, we are living in a, in a very diverse landscape with different types of uh, crops, with different uh, sizes of crops, different types of incomes, infrastructure for innovation, knowledge, awareness, but also digital saviness. So only by applying ad hoc solutions to these diverse demographic, technological um, and uh, societal factors, we will be able to actually transform the agri-food system. And last but not least, of course, we are dealing with a very fragmented ecosystem in which the implementation of, policy, uh, of policies, um, if it is not if it is too flexible, it doesn't have the impact that we are desiring, but if it is not flexible enough, uh, it also doesn't, doesn't have the, the right impact. So these are a bit of the, of the reasons behind why the, the situation is not smarter, greener and, and more local. But I have to say I'm a, I am positive and in EA Food, we do believe that there are businesses opportunities and that not only businesses, but the governments and farmers and the whole value chain need to see the business case behind that. Um, if we have a look at, the, at what the gurus say, we can say that transforming the, the way in which uh, the world uh, is uh, using the food and the land um, is necessary to achieve the sustainable development goals. And um, it is 
estimated that there is a business opportunity of four billion dollars by 2030. I cannot even think on the on the zeros behind that number. But what I can tell you is that to achieve this, um, the public and the private sector need to work together, and we can build a stronger economic case. How, of course. Um, we can always develop new revenue streams. We can always improve uh, the, the value chain integration with premium prices, with secure and increased demand, but also with a reduced cost of land or, or uh, better um, insurance products. We can also, of course, uh, incentivize the adoption of new technology and more sustainable practices to achieve this business opportunity that is behind. And, I cannot forget about the perception that the primary sector and producers have behind this, because at the moment um, it's not perceived sometimes that there is actually a business opportunity by being more sustainable and applying uh, better, better practices. What is the role of uh, EAT food in, in all of this? Um, I always like to say that we are connecting the dots. Uh, one of the reasons for Southern and Central Eastern Europe, uh, Europe countries to lag behind in innovation is that we are missing the right links in between education, universities, higher education institutions, um, uh, innovation, researchers, and, and uh, yeah, innovation, and uh, industry. And at the end of the day, what is, what is our goal? Our goal is for a uh, student to develop an entrepreneurial mindset to develop ideas and for those ideas to become a pilot. A pilot that doesn't stay at the university or at the research center that becomes real and becomes a successful business or it's used by the industry. And you can see here in the middle public engagement, I can never forget about uh, engaging the consumers in everything that we do because if we are talking about food, if we don't engage and, and we don't see what are the current and the future demands of consumers, we will never achieve our purpose in connecting these, these dots. What are we doing to that? We are building a community, a community that is formed by big companies, by medium and small companies as well. Um, at the end of the day, um, SMEs are the 96% of, um, of the companies, organizations that we have in, in Europe, and we can not leave them behind. Um, we also have in our community research centers and universities, and of course, startups, which are the current and, and future innovators, and absolutely key uh, on, on our community. And, how are we working with them? We have defined three missions towards we want to achieve our goals, which are developing fully transparent, fair and resilient food supply system, developing um, programs that bring to healthier lives from food and developing activities as well that help to achieve a net zero food system. We connect the dots and we work across six, functional, uh, six uh, focus areas. Two of them are transversal to uh, all of them. Of course, consumer centricity, as I was saying, and the digital transformation across the whole food system. And let me go a bit in deep on, on the type of activities that we do that are very tangible, pragmatical, and on the ground, actually. We do it by providing uh, all our um, stakeholders, the beneficiaries, and the active parts with the network. We provide them with the innovation ecosystem. And when I say innovation ecosystem, is, uh, is by surrounding them with the mindset of innovation, the disruption, the different way of uh, thinking. And, and we do have that through our community. The risk management is essential. And it is essential um, to, to incentivize the use of new technologies, the uh, application of, of uh, different innovation ecosystem systems, and uh, and to everything at the end. Uh, financing, uh, because one of the reasons as well across uh, South and Central Eastern Europe countries is that without that uh, push of uh, or small funding, uh, you don't get uh, encouraged to, to, to do it. Bring in education and awareness. And again, awareness not only to consumers, but also to um, the primary sector and the uh, companies. 
and policy. And I, I did love uh, hearing about what Elena was uh, saying, because we also have uh, some policy programs that like the Executive Academy or the Policy Council that I will not go in deep today, but through those programs we are uh, connecting uh, participants from across different European countries, uh, bringing together what are their policies on their countries, bringing the network and um, working with them to bring them as well knowledge on the latest technologies, on the latest um, uh, applications that uh, we are seeing and, and the demands of the, the, of the industry, but also the consumers. So I, I would love to, to make some connections out of uh, today. But uh, yeah, how, how do we apply as well these um, this, uh, factors that I was mentioning? Um, we have two activities, regenerative agriculture program and test farms that I will explain to you in a, in a second, through which we do a bit of uh, all of this. On the test farms program, we are matching startups and farmers in the way that startups can um, test their technology, can scale and can use their solution across different countries, across these diverse um, crops that I was mentioning, across different types of, um, of climate conditions and, uh, and ways of working. But also the farmers minimize the risk of buying a new solution that maybe later in the future is not good for them. They only test it in a small part of their farms. And if they like it, they can keep using it uh, later. So again, we are providing a solution that is ad hoc for the startups that come from uh, different countries in Europe and farmers that again are split across uh, different regions. I would love to show you today some of the examples. You have the links and the videos here. Uh, I don't have time today, but please go and, and have a look uh, because you, you have all the, all the links here and uh, they are really, really interesting. These are only four, but we have plenty of, of examples across Europe. And we also have the regenerative agriculture program. And here, it, it is a mix of uh, actually what uh, everything that I was mentioning before. We do help farmers in this transition to the implementation of more sustainable practices, regenerative uh, farming practices. Why? Because we do believe that by applying that those regenerative practices, the soil health improves, the animal and the plant health improves, and with that, our health improves. And through this program, what we are providing farmers is, first of all, with a farmer to farmer training, farmers almost never believe on, uh, on the theory and the um, advice from the gurus and top experts, they do believe on what others are doing. And by seeing that, they start implementing it. They go through a two, day, two three day uh, bootcamp and up until now we have trained almost 300 farmers. They also have a manual that they can follow anytime. And we have developed a series of videos that they can use as a guidance on, to see what they are applying. We do provide them with technical advice. Uh, they have the advice of an agronomist for three years. And this advice is not only on the land and, and how they are applying the new uh, techniques, but it's also on the business case, on how they can uh, set up this business uh, or the, yeah, this business uh, at a local level. We do measure the impact that the new practices are having in the soil, in the plants and the cattle that, uh, that we are working with. And uh, of course, uh, we do measure the, the carbon sequestration as well. And we are developing a, a huge campaign of consumer engagement outreach because without uh, consumers knowing and appreciating what uh, it's done, they, it will never be devalued. Um, so together, uh, yeah, if, if, you, if you want to have a look again, I have put here some links and, and you can dig a bit on, on what we are doing and what we mean by this regenerative agriculture practices. And I can only encourage you to keep, uh, to stay tuned uh, and to follow our events that uh, the next will be on November. That is uh, all from my side today. Uh, educate, innovate and transform to develop a more sustainable and healthier uh, food system. Thank you very much. And of course, we do have many, many other programs that I didn't have time to go through them today, but uh, I am happy if you want to get in touch with me and, uh, and bring any question that you have. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Elvia. That was very inspiring. And we have many 
questions from the chat and many people want to connect with you. So, mm -hmm. so that's great. Mark, do you have any question? Yeah, well, firstly, uh, big, big thank you, Elvira. I think you've uh, you know, opened this discussion uh, very thoughtfully and in, uh, in an engaging way. So congratulations. Um, as Arnaud said, there are a couple of detailed questions that you can answer in the chat. And I mean, if you answer to everybody, uh, I think that would be the e easiest way, some quite precise questions, but certainly uh, reach out. Uh, and how open is the network? We've seen some questions on a, can science parts, can technopoles join in? Uh, to what extent are small farmers part of your networks? So I think those you can, you can answer. Um, I'd like to follow up on two issues. One, uh, Arnaud touched upon it, these are sort of bigger societal challenge issues. And, you know, we're all aware of the supermarket shopping basket is now going up and up and up. So I think you've got the community uh, at the heart of your, well, one of the uh, user uh, groups. Um, perhaps also understanding the links that the regional policymakers could, could make with you, Elvira. You, you said, you know, in response to Eleanor's presentation, how you connect uh, with the policymakers. To what extent can our audience of, you know, the policy learning platform uh, engage with the EIT, you know, the regional policymakers? What is the, the best way of taking that forward? Uh, and then just perhaps one comment, I think uh, at the Interreg Policy Learning Platform team, we often connect with other programs and we've seen, for example, DG Grow uh, has identified, you know, the agri-food sector as one of their 14 key industrial uh, ecosystem uh, and value chains to target. Uh, so the second question, do you connect with, with those and, and the clusters that are delivering, you know, urban farming solutions and things like that? So those would be the two quick questions, Elvira. <laughs> it's two long uh, questions. Um, in fact, the policymakers can engage um, first through dedicated programs that we have, like a Government Executive Academy, that I can share the link with you as organizers, and, and then you can share it with all of them. Perfect. Um, we also have a Risk Policy Council. Uh, this Policy Council is um, helping us, supporting us on defining strategies, on defining priorities, and defining the actual challenges uh, across the risk countries. And when I say risk countries, those are the countries that have been um, classified by the European scoreboard as modest to moderate innovator countries. And we do acknowledge the, the need behind uh, bringing those forward. So this is why we have set specific programs like the Executive Academy and the Policy Council for those countries to um, make easier um, the cross learning between different countries, but also share it with Nordic and our other uh, more innovative countries. Um, so those are specific programs that I will share the link. Um, of course, next to that, we always uh, are in favor of having policymakers um, together with us as speakers, as um, part of our programs. And uh, in, I, I don't know, it's, uh, they are an, a key part of everything that we do. So um, they do represent uh, different organizations. And, as well, like in countries like uh, Portugal, for example, we do work with different uh, with different organizations and public uh, organizations in different uh, in different activities. I can also think about the research infrastructure network in which we are engaging and matching um, higher education institutions, research um, centers with policymakers, so they can make a business case out of that and they can and we can support them on the commercialization of their infrastructure in a in a better way so there are plenty of opportunities um and they come from time to time they they are not open unfortunately for the whole year but uh, i am more than happy to share with you uh, okay. the link that's it. That, I think if you use the chat to share the, some of those links just a quick um uh, uh, question from the audience how do farmers actually engage with you? At what, what, what level? Is it uh, through uh, uh, a farming organization, uh, representative bodies, or, or how do they work be, with you? It can be uh, both ways. It can be through a farming organization. And then uh, from my point, it's, it's better because our impact bring, uh, goes it's to broader. a mm. number, yeah, higher mm. number of 
partners, but it can be at an individual level as well. Uh, in Spain, for example, we are working with individual farmers that are developing the regenerative agriculture program because they, they followed the boot camps, the, the training mm -hmm. courses that are face to face in different regions. Mm -hmm. At the moment, we have started the program in uh, Spain, Portugal and Italy, but our ambition is to, to scale it up to other uh, countries. And yeah, they follow the trainings and then they they get engaged into the more activities and it can be done and at an individual right. level. But if a farming organization applies, we are welcoming them. Yeah, so I guess regional policymakers could offer their, uh, let's say, uh, services to help organize a boot camp in their, uh, in their regions. Definitely. Good, so that's, a, that's an offer for all of the 44 people who are following your presentation uh, today. Thanks, Elvira. Arnaud, any points from your side that before we move on to our next speaker? Okay. We have a, a last question from Christaps, one yeah. of our policy officers. Um, what are the accessibility conditions for farmers to engage with these services provided by EIT Food? The commissions, there are no commissions for farmers. Not at all. Great, <laughs> no, no conditions. That's great to hear. They have to join the program and they have to... <clears throat> To, to to be there for the if it is for the bootcamp for the bootcamp and of course if they uh, want to get engaged into the three years uh, advice program they have to commit to be part of it but to the farmers the individuals there are no um, any other yes. economical commitment I would say excellent excellent thank you so much Elvia for your presentation that was super great. We have to move on, but you stay with us for panel discussion. Let's move on to uh, Portugal. Rosinda, your good practices uh, from the Citizen Project, looking at urban farming uh, ecosystems. So the floor is yours, and you have uh, 10 minutes to present your, your good practice. Hey, thank you so much. I will share my presentation. Yes, perfect. And you need to go to yes. Definite Sounds. Yes. I'm trying to, but I cannot. Is, is this other one, the Definite Sounds, the monitor? You have to click on that and then change the. Okay. Yes. Okay. There we go. Well, Excellent. So Thank you so much for the opportunity to share our experience in Matala. Um, this is a community project and very focused on the community. Uh, Matala is a municipality in the south interior of Portugal in a very deserted area in terms of population. Uh, we have only 6,202 um, inhabitants and a population density of 4.8 uh, inhabitants per kilometer square. And 30, almost 36% of our residents are over 65 years old. So we have a problem of aging in the population. Um, also, we have uh, also um, a problem, sorry, to go forward. Okay, I cannot. Okay, sorry. Um, we also have a problem with uh, a high vulnerability to climate change and extreme weather events, especially because we are in a very arid uh, uh, area uh, with hot, dry summers uh, and uh, a lack of rain. Normally, we have an average of 285 days uh, without rain per year. And so we have a high vulnerability to um, desertification. And so um, in 2017, uh, a group of people uh, and organizations, um, including the municipality, which I represent here too, decided to um, take action uh, with the resources and with the, um, the community. 
that we had. And mainly we focused on uh, a strategy that would increase our resilience uh, towards the, the problems that I mentioned before. So we decided to um, look at Matula as a laboratory for the future uh, and try to enhance um, projects, big projects, small projects, big initiatives, small initiatives um, that would try and essay answers um, and projects um, to transform the territory into a more resilient um, a territory, but also see the territory uh, as a laboratory of experiences uh, and just not stay um, and contemplate the problem. We decided to take action with our own means, so to say. So uh, our strategy or this laboratory works in many areas. Uh, in education, in um, social and territorial uh, cohesion, in terms of culture and heritage, it works in terms of how to transform our local economy in a more sustainable economy. We work with governments in governance and networks and how to uh, also um, make a, a more resilient community. And we work also in a in a way to transform and to tra have a transition to a more agroecological uh, local um, system um, and to have a local agenda for this transition uh, in order also to respond to this threat of climate change and desertification. So I am talk going to present in a very short way what what was the path to build or to um, organize this local food network and also to put the, the, the territory in this path to a, a more agroecological um, territory. So the first thing was to gather all the members of the community that could have um, uh, a role in this process, in this transition. So we call up Got farmers, we call up local uh, authorities, um, uh, the municipality, the schools, um, the, the entrepreneurs, and we invite them to several meetings in order to say what uh, is going to be our path and what are we going to do together. So the project was not a project of one institution, it was a project of the community. The first thing we decided to, to work on was on um, engaging the community to the process. And so we started with the uh, school community. Uh, and so in all our primary schools, we created uh, forest gardens. So it was not just um, a, a garden for the school. We teach the children how to produce uh, food in a regenerative way. So uh, we teach them um, practices that in produce uh, food, but also uh, protect the soil uh, and uh, increase the number of trees in the system, in the agricultural uh, uh, system, and also help the soil to retain more water. So that's what we did with the children uh, from uh, all in all our primary schools. And today we have five um, syntropic gardens in all our schools. And they are there since uh, 2017, like I said. And uh, all of the children in our community learn how to uh, do uh, regenerative farming. We had several. Uh, other activities with kids. Uh, we also have um, a kitchen academy so that the, the children will not only uh, learn how to produce food but also how to cook it um, so that we can um, start to change our food habits in order to improve locally our 
uh, food um, uh, autonomy and improve also have to, some um, uh, less dependent on process, processed food and uh, make the children more used to eat uh, natural and local uh, food. Also in the community, we decided to have night sessions at the municipality um, uh, markets. So we gathered people to talk about sustainability, about uh, sustainable ways of producing food, eating food, and also uh, to talk about several uh, issues that concern the community. Uh, so normally we invite people to the market at night, we invite someone to talk about uh, a theme, and we also invite the community to prepare us uh, a meal. Uh, and so uh, during the, the, um, this event, um, we had, fortunately, the participation of many people from the community, but also tourists, because Matale is a very tourist area. And so it was a good exchange because out of these sessions in the market, we developed other uh, projects with the, with the community. So new projects came out of this uh, idea. We also start work, working with farmers in peer learning uh, experiences and communities of practice. So we, we visit other farmers. We had courses, seminars, workshops. We created uh, uh, visits to uh, international uh, projects that were uh, a reference for us. We promoted visits between farmers in Matala so that everyone could share what they were doing. Uh, and um, we started to um, increase our visits to agroecological and regenerative farming practices in order to exchange knowledge between uh, farmers um, in our territory. We also created a demonstrative center in agroecology uh, and um, where we experience and monitor different uh, regenerative uh, farming techniques. We also have a garden and a nursery of adapted, more adapted varieties that we are uh, testing. And um, we also um, have in there a volunteer program. We, we receive students and volunteers from all over the world to learn about the techniques that we are um, experiencing there. Um, and also they participate in the gardening network that we have in the territory and help uh, uh, manage those gardens. So this is the center in some of these classes. Uh, we are, we have funding for um, a big project, a big research uh, center with the, um, and we have already the, the partnership between, to, with the, um, the University of Oporto here in Portugal and other universities. So it's a project we are starting to uh, transform this old building that was um, connected with cereal uh, production in the territory and it was abandoned for a lot of years, and we are going to transform it in this research and development center. Uh, we, are, we have already uh, this center in place here in Matala, in other facilities. So we are already doing research and monitoring all the experience that we have, and the core uh, issues that we are going to study and um, uh, in the center is biodiversity because we are in a one, one more minute, uh, Rosina. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do it fast. Uh, it's we are going to study more in the terms of biodiversity, agroecology, and also in wild resources. This is some of the example of our network of gardens that we have all over the, the municipality. Uh, we have a land exchange program. So uh, and loaners give their lands so that we can have more gardens in a train after a training program uh, people apply and then they 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 have to apply um, in a training program they they can um, then go to a land that is offered by a lane owner here in Matala 
We also work at the markets with our products. Uh, we are already putting our products in the school and social institutions canteens. Some, some other projects, local uh, producer markets, we have a, a, a website to sell our products and we deliver uh, food and um, uh, fresh baskets to the community. After this, a lot of projects uh, developed here, small projects, big projects, all of them related with food. So now we have different projects going on. I can share then the link. And well, thank you. <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Rosinda. That was uh, really inspiring. Uh, many, many people are saying that also that in the chat. So thank you so much. I love the, all, the, all the photos. I really want to be in Portugal in Metholon now. And I really like the way you, in, this integrated strategy that you use to mobilize, advocate, and also educate uh, people on local food uh, network. Yes. I've got a question for you, but maybe Mark has questions as well. No, you, uh, while you're talking, Arnaud, you go ahead. Thanks, Mark. So I was wondering what was the trigger to, to start this process of uh, the local food network? Was it like the local challenges, what some visionary leaders, uh, what was the trigger of, of this uh, transformative change? Um, I, the first thing was that w we were um, facing a lot of problems in the territory. The main ones I said, it's of course, we are few. Uh, we are only 6,000 inhabitants in a huge area. We have over 1,200 1, kilometers square in the territory, so we are few. Uh, and we have a, a, a big issue concerning uh, climate change. And uh, <coughs> agriculture, uh, agriculture is struggling. Um, and so, and it's the main, one of the main activities here alongside with tourism. Uh, so we know that we have to change our practices. Uh, and so, um, because th the main agriculture in, in here is uh, an, uh, animal production, uh, cows and sheep. And mm -hmm. we realize that that is not sustainable. So we need to change what we are doing. And so th this is the, the, the start of a process. So uh, in order to communicate this to farmers and to the community, we needed to start uh, somewhere. So mm. just get uh, go to a farmer and say, you have to stop raising cows. Mm. We need alternatives. So what we are doing is experiencing alternatives and to engage the community, we had to have something else. And so we started with food because we are not all farmers, but we all eat. So um, that's how we, we decided to engage. Let's do the strategy focused on food and not on farmer in farming. And so we can understand how we have to change and involve the entire community in it. So now we know that we have to eat different and produce different. Mm -hmm. Now at this moment, we have more farmers, big farmers, um, trying to change their practices and we are experiencing practices in um, more uh, big properties, not in such a small scale that like we started. Uh, and they are here because they were, um, their attention was called by the community. It was the community, it's the community that it's making the pressure that mm. changed the way we are treating our territory. Mm. Really interesting. There's a question in the chat um, asking, was it difficult to persuade older population to change the way they were doing things? Was it like a specific group of people then? No, the old, uh, um, it's difficult to change uh, uh, farmers, big farmers. Mm. Uh, uh, it's not uh, difficult to change the, the old people that have small farms mm. um, because they understand the process because some of the techniques that we are applying, 
were part of their uh, traditional techniques. So they abandoned those techniques, uh, but they are aware that the practices that they have now are not good for the soil and for the land. So mm. it's easy for them to understand. Um, and they are not so dependent on, on, on European fundings and all of that. So it's for them, small farmers, it's mm. uh, more easy to change. Big ones, uh, with big lands, it's more difficult. Not so easy. Mm. Yeah. Mm -mm. Mark, do you yeah, want to add something? Just, first, congratulations, uh, Hosinda. And I think we see it from the comments, the sort of inspirational nature of, of, of such a, a story. Uh, and I know Arnold is working on this, this issue of, of storytelling uh, as a means for uh, policy development and also policy progression. And I think you illustrated that perfectly uh, in your presentation. Um, one uh, very technical and um, probably boring question, but you can, you can think about this, is as Arnold said, what were the triggers? Um, the question I had was, did you set yourself any targets for success? Did you say you wanted to achieve X, Y, Z, you know, when, when people want to fund uh, something, policymakers will say, well, I want 10 of these gardens. I want 20 farmers to change. Had you, did you give yourself a sort of a, a set of targets that you could say we're on the right track for delivering this a new you know, yeah. initiative? The, 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 the target that we have uh, is that we want to have our social and um, uh, local canteens, school canteens, social canteens, uh, with um, near 90% uh, <clears> the <throat> vegetables produced locally. Mm -hmm. So that's our main target mm -hmm. uh, for the food local network. Mm -hmm. Then we want uh, the other target that we have is that we want to um, uh, transform uh, the, local f the local farming system. So we now have uh, 10 farmers uh, that are in a, a pilot project, uh, and I'm talking about big uh, farmers. And our main target is that we can have 20 uh, uh, in, the, in the next 10 years. So it's not a project for, for uh, uh, just for me, it's a project for the future. Mm -hmm. It's a compromise. And what uh, our, our main thing is that for farmers to be compromised, we need the entire community to be uh, compromised. So it has to be the community that is going to force the change. Um, so if our kids and our children and our elderly are eating better and are healthier, um, there will be a pressure. So this is, we don't have... Um, uh, big um, expectations, uh, but uh, we are going step by step and we uh, feel and know that we are very different from where we started. But we also know that it's a, a commitment. You, you, you're not, you, have, you walk forward and you walk back. We have the, the problem of the, pandem the, the pandemia uh, and this is a community project. And we, that, that, that was very clear from your presentation, yes. the community, uh, yes. schools and population. And, mm -hmm. the, and, and in, the, in the pandemia, we had a problem because we need to be close to people and communicate. In mm -hmm. the pandemia, we were apart and there were a lot of um, problems going on, people creating suspicious about the project and all of that because we are trying to promote uh, a transformation. Mm -hmm. And this is going against some statements and some mm. um, uh, uh, ideas and systems that are installed. And so that was very hard. But now we, we are in a good track again because, and this is very interesting because uh, the first, then w now we, we can be together again. And we are uh, in the same point in terms of uh, uh, the path that we are going. People. Engagement, yeah. Yeah, mm. so it's, um, and now we have more big farmers with us because they, they are already um, seeing the results. We have, we have results, you know. Mm -hmm. So we saw, our... we saw on Elvira's uh, presentation, the first uh, bar chart of the trillions of business that, uh, uh, you know, we, we've generated was food and health. 
and you highlighted that in your just your last yes. statement is in the sort of the path was you know through what we eat food uh, food it's it's health and uh, just the physical activity of getting people in their gardens uh, uh, and of big farmers is another uh, step towards you know creating healthier food and, and selling locally yeah. I All think right. we have to move on now, Arnaud, we don't have we? have to move on. Thank you so much, uh, Rosinda, for such an uh, inspiring story. And you already have like some farmers S from Swedish, Sweden. Swedish farmers, Swedish farmers are on farmers their way. To, to visit you, yeah. So be ready to welcome some Swedish farmers. Let's move on. Last, last but not least, uh, Vasiliki, the, the floor is yours. We move to Italy and Greece. So yes, we can see full screen mode. Okay. Open your microphone as well. Yes, you need to have your mic on. Yeah, okay. Excellent. Can you Thanks. see the presentation? Everything is good. I hope you can also see the slides. Okay, moving one after the other. Yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. So thank you for inviting me in this uh, wonderful webinar today. Uh, I hope I can also contribute somehow to the discussion. Um, so, um, the reason uh, I was invited was to present uh, some, uh, our, uh, uh, one of, uh, of uh, the good practices that we identified in the framework of uh, our project, the Remore project, uh, a project uh, that uh, has been completed in December, was completed in December 2021 and is now uh, in the third phase of additional activities. So the project uh, was about uh, rural and urban partnerships motivating regional economies. And the main target was to establish uh, collaborations around innovation and synergies between rural and urban areas. It was a project uh, uh, that was led by our precious lead partner, the University of Hamburg in Germany. And we were eight partners in total from five countries. So, um, first of all, some of the lessons learned through the Rumor project. Um, the lessons that came out of the good practices that we identified during the uh, knowledge ex exchange experience, uh, procedure and also through the policies uh, that we more or less achieved uh, to accomplish. So, um, tackling the needs of traditional industries in the agri-food uh, agri chain plays a central role in rural development policies. Um, so if you want to achieve uh, policies uh, in this sector, you need first to tackle uh, and identify and tackle the needs of, uh, of uh, farmers, first to say. Rural and urban cooperation can help regions to boost innovation in primary sector, and uh, this can be done through new technologies and cross-sectoral collaborations. We have a wonderful example in Rumor uh, coming from Greece, the um, agro-design cluster, which, which was really a bright example in the project, showing how the producers and small farmers can uh, collaborate with the creativity uh, sector, with designers, packaging designers, uh, branding designers, advertisers, in order to tell the story more efficiently and um, promote uh, local products. And innovation leads to competitiveness, diversification of, of rural economy and reduction of environmental impact. So innovation can help in multiple ways uh, the only issue is how to, uh, to um, transfer innovation to the sector and uh, implement specific um, uh, methods and techniques. A few words about uh, the fresh fruit good practice. This is a pilot project of the high tech farming the regional partnership. Uh, which uh, is a partnership operating under the smart specialization platform of the European Commission. And um, this uh, pilot project brings together technological solutions regarding fresh fruits, mainly grapes and kiwis, 
and it aims to uh, test and establish these uh, technologies, these technological solutions at demonstration farms, at three demonstration farms in Central Macedonia and Tuscany. So the partnership seeks to create an ecosystem. This ecosystem will test, disseminate and commercialize the technological solutions and uh, will also connect uh, regional authorities, demonstration farms and technology providers. So it brings together these three actors uh, under one roof uh, to cooperate and uh, end up with uh, the technological solutions that will be tested and disseminated uh, at, the pilot, um, at the pilot areas. And uh, what led to the development of this uh, um, uh, pilot project? What was the challenge? Uh, so there is there was a strong interest coming from the region of Central Macedonia and also the American Farm School, which operates in Saloniki, uh, to better address the needs of regional producers of grapes and kiwis. And uh, the new service, this uh, cooperation, this cluster was inspired by the experiences of the Tuscany region and the demonstration farm in Alberese which shows in practice the economic benefits of uh, uh, viticulture, uh, which is the agriculture of grapes and selective harvesting. You can see here the total budget of the project. Uh, private investments were attracted under this pilot project, and there is also strong potential to create revenues. We have some uh, more information in uh, our um, uh, website in more website about uh, this project. Unfortunately, I, I, uh, I cannot share many technical uh, you know, information uh, about it, uh, but uh, the owner that appears in the uh, website, the American Farm School is willing to um, discuss and share more information if needed. And uh, now, um, what Rumor has to recommend, uh, based on the fresh fruit uh, good practice, the rest of our good practices, and also the achieved policy changes. Um, so in order to, um, to contribute to the smart and green agri, agri food chain, we have to create mechanisms, supporting mechanisms for knowledge and technology transfer to rural areas. We have to promote innovation through living labs and open innovation networks involving urban and rural actors. Um, we have to support the decentralized uh, research. We have to create decentralized research infrastructure and then entrepreneurial services. And uh, support cross-sectoral urban and rural partnerships in the field of smart specialization. And finally, uh, to unlock circular economy potentials, uh, the farmers, especially as the previous speaker said, uh, small farmers apply uh, procedures um, and um, uh, practices in their farms, which um, uh, uh, are actually circular economy uh, practices, but they do not actually know it. So uh, this uh, concept uh, um, creates great uh, uh, entrepreneurial potentials, uh, but uh, the um, stakeholders and uh, the farmers, so to say, need to know it, need to know how to uh, exploit it. So uh, this was my, my very short uh, presentation, and I suppose I'm very much into the time limits. <laughs> Excellent. Exactly. Thank you so much, uh, Vasiliki, for, for sharing this uh, good practice as well. Super inspiring, super interesting. Uh, Mark, do you have a question? Yeah, thanks, Vasiliki. Uh, two of my favorite letters in your recommendation slide, S3. Uh, we all know we, we live and breathe with smart specialization strategies, and, 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 you, and you highlight the, the cross-sectorial dimension. 
uh, I just was interested to, to know whether, uh, could you give us an example of a sort of a policy uh, initiative that uh, you know, is found in your S3 that epitomizes the, uh, the project and best practice you've just prepared and presented? Uh, well, um, we have, well, within the project, uh, there were, um, um, uh, apart from this, good practice which I presented. There were uh, some uh, other very good examples coming from uh, the Netherlands and Amsterdam uh, where we had uh, the establishment of, uh, um, of an, an institute, the Amsterdam Institute for Advanced Metropolitan Solutions, which uh, actually uh, brought together universities, cities and business from the Netherlands to work and design solutions for uh, social, economic and environmental challenges. And one of the living labs, which uh, actually um, operated under this uh, metropolitan initiative uh, was, um, uh, the aim of this lab was to support localized food systems in the metropolitan region. Uh, and, um, what uh, this network did was to work on regional agricultural markets uh, to cultivate healthier food consumption patterns, reduce food waste and uh, lower carbon emissions as well. Okay, mm -hmm. I mean, that's useful. I mean, I think a number of the people who are participating online are from regional authority or similar organizations. And, with the S3 uh, opportunity, we see how regions are, are working together in sort of uh, well, this agri-food platform for S3 partnerships, which uh, is touching upon a number of the themes in, in all three of the presentations. So I think that's another way in which I think the policy learning agenda that the good practices highlight can actually be cascaded through a, a, a broader community. So your example, the mention of living labs is, is, a, is a good example of the type of initiative that. Uh, can be, uh, let's say, exploited. So, thanks. Uh, I didn't see any questions online, and with, with my colleagues, they've got more more eyes than I have. No, uh, no there question any questions? online. Yeah. So maybe please... we can move to the panel discussion, Arnaud. Uh, get everyone. Actually, there is a question from from Elena uh, uh, in the chats. Go ahead. So, Elena, go ahead. Please ask uh, directly your question to Vasily. Thank you. Sorry, yes, I'm a bit too slow. <laughs> I just wanted to ask Vasily, uh, well, the, the final slide with all the recommendations, mm. uh, lots of thoughts about, about them because each, each of them, in fact, hide behind uh, lot, many, many things, many, many elements to, to, to consider. Um, I was interested in particular uh, in, the, in the decentralization of research infrastructure, which is something that we uh, look uh, often in Internet Europe uh, in, in our projects and I wanted to simply if, to, to know if you could elaborate more on that like uh, how do you see this Elena, process for your question yeah. um, uh, we saw during the project a very good example coming from uh, Germany from the Lüneburg region uh, with uh, a decentralized uh, research center uh, by the word decentralized, we mean uh, having uh, established research infrastructure, not only in uh, big cities, and, uh, but also uh, in smaller areas, in decentralized regions, uh, so that uh, local uh, farmers and uh, local business can, um, um, can, uh, can find and uh, try to come into contact and try to find solutions for, uh, for solutions or support for ideas that they might have, but also to uh, be easier uh, to transfer knowledge from the research institutes to them. Uh, I recently um, saw a very uh, inspiring um, uh, presentation saying that innovation is not what the, re the research institutes try to promote, but what actually and finally, the users adapt. So uh, it's, uh, uh, it is important to have innovation being developed in research institutes, but it is also very important this, this knowledge to be transferred to the users and the users actually to adopt it. 
So if you have decentralized centers for innovation, uh, like the one, as I said, that we saw in Lunenburg region, uh, uh, it, you make this process easier. All right, so excellent. The general concept behind this uh, recommendation. Thank you, Vasiliki. Before we move on, there is a last question from Mia, and she wants to know a little bit more. How did you organize uh, the test beds? The, yeah. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm afraid I cannot answer to this question because I don't have technical information uh, around how the pilot project was actually run. I mean, uh, regarding test pens, uh, I suppose that you mean pilot testing with technologies on, on the field. Um, I'm, I, I'm not very uh, aware of this technical information, I'm afraid, um, as well as of numbers, but I know that it's a, a growing number of farmers participating in, in, this, in this pilot project. And uh, the American Farm School uh, employs some very, you know, uh, very dedicated stuff uh, which cover this technique, this part of uh, the scientific part, and they can actually support themselves, the farmers that participate in this pilot project. Uh, however, I cannot elaborate more on this question. All right, so following up later with uh, Mia. All right, I think it's time to move to our panel discussion. We have a little bit more than 10 minutes before we summarize and conclude. Um, so panel discussion, Mark, I leave you yeah. the floor. So the panel discussion doesn't mean listening to Arno and me for 10 minutes. It, uh, it means also ask your questions. But uh, I, I've got some comments just to, to, to launch our, our, our session. I mean, firstly, I, I think we've had three uh, very interesting uh, presentations, not only because food is, is, is interest to all of us, whether we're buying it, eating it, or just looking at it because it's pretty uh, in our restaurant uh, plate. Uh, but I think it's also, I think one of the challenges that we, uh, we can see through these different presentations is, is the contrasts that, and the challenges that we face. I mean, recently I read of um, some uh, researchers in the USA who were testing uh, the response of, uh, of, of seeds in soil that had been brought back from the moon in the um, anticipation of going to the moon and, and digging and uh, putting some plants in the ground there. So we got at the one stage, you know, the, the high level technology, uh, you know, driven. Uh, and then we, if we come to, uh, to Portugal, where we've got, uh, uh, you know, people, children, mares, putting their fingers in the soil and, and, and creating regenerative uh, farming, uh, you know, live. And so we have this, you know, great spectrum uh, and one of the issues that I think um, was raised during, I think, Elvira's presentation, I think it was Michael McManus who, who said, uh, he made the statement rather than a question, said one of the questions with, uh, you know, uptake of latest technologies uh, and resource is, is the question of the affordability. Uh, and, you know, it's, do you have to have a thousand cows in the milk shed for your, uh, you know, uh, GPS tracking uh, service to be economical to know what's happening and the health and performance of each animal, or can it work at different scales? So that's one of the questions I could put to it to Elvira uh, and, and other speakers could respond. But it's the affordability of some of the technology solutions. We talk a lot about cross sector or bringing the digital into the farmyard uh, and. I'm just get your response on that, Elvira, the affordability of technology in the farming world. Of course, um, at the moment, um, some of the technology is, is not yet uh, affordable to the farmers. Um, and this is why it is important to actually test and scale the technology so that it can become uh, affordable uh, for them to, to put it in use on a day-to-day on -day basis. Um, but yeah, it's, it's certainly one of the challenges that it's stopping them sometimes to, to, to use it, definitely. Yeah, I think you highlighted the need for farmers to uh, uh, listen to other farmers and not just the, the technology uh, 
gurus to uptake. Yes, yes, indeed. Uh, leading by example, at the end of the day, uh, it is what, uh, mm, what has the highest impact according to, to our experience and on the ground activities that we are doing. Yeah. And, uh, and that on the ground, uh, uh, you know, uh, let's say, learning by listening to others, uh, Rosinda, was that something also worked in your uh, get the big farmers on board? You said you've got 10, you want to get up to 20. Uh, to what extent do these farmers that have been converted uh, to the new farming uh, approach help you convert others? Um, uh, it was a, um, a long-term process. So uh, at the first meetings, we had all those farmers. Um, and then uh, because the, the process is difficult, um, we lost some on the way. Uh, but then, like I said, we need to be very persistent and exchanging um, uh, information and letting people to see and share experience with other farmers that have already uh, made the, the, the process to a, a more regenerative farming, uh, not only here in Portugal, we visit some of them in Spain that some experiences. Um, and when farmers talk between them, um, it's, it's different. We had a lot of sessions in rooms but we realize that a farmer transforms itself when it's in the field. So we, we don't have more sessions in rooms. We take farmers into the, 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 the field and all the conversations and the training and the process occurs there because um, the change uh, needs to uh, be uh, held in the field, not in, in, the, um, in the rooms. Um, and so, like I said, it's a very persistent process and it has to be a change that comes from the inside. So um, it's like, a, a, it's not only a bottom-up change because um, uh, uh, we are doing this also to change policies because some farmers are not doing the, the right or using the right techniques or uh, because the policies and the fundings are letting them other way. So what we are doing is small scale projects, monetizing them, including, okay, 10 farmers, we have uh, many more, but, and then, monetizing results and say, this is the right way to do it. You need to change the policies for territories like Mersola, because if we continue to do this, uh, we will not have any more soil. And we have very, very few uh, uh, soil. It's a huge problem we have in here. So it's implication, it's commitment, it's persistence, and you, you have, to um, respect the farmer. Um, uh, and the farmer needs to feel that he's respected. Um, and so, because uh, what we also uh, felt is like most of the farmers don't want their children to be farmers. So what we are doing also in schools is to, um, we need to respect the farmer and all of the land caretakers um, because um, they are the ones that are providing us uh, food and are doing the landscape management. Um, and so we, we need to do that. And by doing that, by respecting the farmer, um, we will caught their, their attention. And that's what is, um, is going on. By persisting, persisting and persisting, uh, I can see, I can see uh, Elvira nodding uh, vigorously while she's been listening I to can, Rosinda. I cannot agree more with what uh, Rosinda is, is just saying. Um, there are also countries like France where they have achieved to, to value, to respect, to qualify farmers um, a lot better than, than other countries. Like I can speak, I can speak about uh, Spain and also Portugal and South, Southern Europe. Mm, and yes, uh, in-farm training, 
um, listening from others, li uh, bringing that example to, to the younger generations. Yeah, I, I cannot agree more. It's so right. If I can uh, also add something to this. Yes, go ahead. Uh, we uh, figure out from uh, various agricultural projects re uh, related to, to technologies and new methods and so on, that it is very efficient uh, to first to approach uh, not individual farmers, but their cooperatives. Mm -hmm. Because in Greece, there are a lot of small agricultural cooperatives mm -hmm. and uh, the farmers uh, tend to uh, rely on these cooperatives for scientific, uh, you know, uh, advice. And uh, it is very important to have the agricultural cooperatives uh, into the stakeholders mapping that we do, because they are the ones that can actually support individual farmers, because uh, the farmers themselves are a very difficult audience. At, at least this is what we tend to understand from our experience. Yeah. So uh, it is always a good idea to approach their cooperatives and uh, train them first, you know, yeah. and they will bring the farmers into the conversation as well. Can, yeah. can I add something? Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, another thing, like, like I said, we need to do this monetized and one of the things that we started to do, and um, now we have a lot of, uh, that's why I talked about the research center. One of our alliances now is science. So um, we are monetizing it with uh, um, universities and researchers. Um, so that, like I said, um, with science, um, and with the community and with farmers to influence uh, um, policy making in order for uh, farming and regenerative practices could be um, uh, improved, financed, and also all of the services that farmers and land takers do can be uh, also financed because it's not just producing food. We are producing soil. And the environment. Uh, we are producing biodiversity. We are in a natural park. Um, there was a species here. Uh, the linux was extinct. And um, thanks to landowners uh, and also um, uh, farmers, we have over 200 linux already in our natural park. And this is, of course, all due to conservation programs, but the ones that are managing the, the land where all these species, natural species occur, are the landowners and the farmers. So this needs to be um, uh, paid um, because uh, our farmers, our landowners have a lot of rules to fill in order for us to have all of this biodiversity in here. And there's no benef direct benefit to it. So we are taking care, uh, but we are not being paid for. So what we are also struggling is that all of these people are taking care of natural resources, soil, water, biodiversity, and producing food. And they are only get paid by the food and badly paid. Yeah, I mean, you highlight an issue of, of the policy connections uh, that are necessary when you have this more holistic uh, uh, approach that you've just identified. You know, it's not just about putting food on the table, it's having a much broader societal impacts, which is the you know, part of the UN's SDGs that we saw in the beginning of Elvira's uh, presentation. Arnold's, we have... Arnold's looking at me and saying we're yes. running out of time. Just quickly, uh, our, our friend Chris Stamps asked a question about technology, uh, startups, and uh, and the farming community. Uh, I, I will answer offline, but I think one of the issues we see in, in the cluster community, how they work together, and an example from Toulouse, where the aerospace cluster is working with the food cluster, and they call themselves Terre d'Etoile. So connecting the ground to the stars with new technology. And so I think you need the right facilitators for, for policymakers. So, but Arnaud wants to uh, give us a, some 
key messages? And key food. messages, key messages here. So we've seen that local food value chains, they require transformative changes from the production to the consumption. So you need to bring together smart and green solution together. Also, we've seen that uh, telling a good story is very important for transformative changes. I mean, the story of Ozinda, Vasiliki, super important. And finally, uh, Elvia, you had like three words at the end of your presentation. I've got three words as well. So a good story can mobilize people, uh, engage the community together. I mean, we've seen like the example in Mertola Food Network. You can use stories also to educate farmers in the local community really important when you address like, such a complex transformative changes in an integrated strategy. And finally, um, story also to advocate, uh, persuading people of the importance of transforming a uh, local food uh, network to make them more sustainable. That's it for me. Mark, if you have any last uh, comments before we close. Yeah, I would just say we, we've seen the, from all examples, the need to connect the policy initiatives uh, and not just be driven by a food subsidy or by a technology startup, uh, you know, the issues of, of scalability. And my last word would be sort of public procurement as a driver of some of these changes. You know, you, uh, I think, uh, uh, Rosinda, you talked about the canteens that are using local food. Well, it's the municipalities that often run these. So uh, I think public procurement can be a driver for some of these broader challenges. And I'm just disappointed we've got uh, so many good questions in the chat yes. that we can't uh, we can't answer uh, everything today, but we'll follow uh, up with, with them. So all right. thank you all. Three more points before we, we close. We are going to organize a very nice web webinar on 28th of uh, June on smart villages, so please uh, register. We are going to write, write a very nice follow-up article on this uh, webinar. And finally, we have a poll to ask you whether you would be interested uh, to participate in one of our matchmaking or a peer review. And then we will uh, follow up with you for the, for the person who are interested. So here you can ask number one, are you interested in peer review? Yes or no? And can we contact you in relation to this question? i just remind you what Eleanor said about peer reviews. It's an on going open call. You don't have to wait for deadlines. You don't have to do it by the end of the month. You can do it tomorrow. You can do it in 10 days, but don't wait. I mean, it's a, we are you know, a de demand service. So you ask us and we can help you. Uh, it's a very simple form and we can interact with you to find the right uh, people. And, you know, you want to take farmers from Sweden to Portugal. Well, yeah. Exactly. So thank you so much. Thank you for the audience for such uh, great uh, questions and being